my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. And in this video, I want to talk about a sort of a book versus movie thing, which is weird because Peter Jackson got it half right and half wrong. And it's one of those that you'd think he just got totally wrong if you weren't really careful. And, well, I'll get to why that is. But the question is, who actually killed Sauron in the War of the Last Alliance? And this question may seem kind of trivial, but it does have some importance because it shows us maybe something interesting about some characterization, not just a random trivia question. So, of course, the reason this is interesting is in the Peter Jackson films, and even in the Ralph Bakshi film, uh, the only real person we get in a direct confrontation with Sauron who does any damage is Isildur. In the Peter Jackson movie, we at least see Elendil go up against Sauron, but he gets pretty much instantly killed by a hit from Sauron's mace. And there's really only a very brief image of Gilgalad in the Peter Jackson film, and the first time I saw the movie, I just assumed that was Elrond, because there's you get so little of him, and they look close enough, and the, the image is so short that you really can't tell... But Gilgalad is in the Peter Jackson movie, but we really see nothing of him. And Elendil, we see, get killed pretty much instantly. Isildur goes to his fallen body. Sauron walks over, reaches for him like a complete moron with his hand, which has the finger, which has the ring on it. And Isildur reaches for the broken hilt shard of Elendil's sword, Narsil, and swipes up and cuts off Sauron's finger, and Sauron implode explodes. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but in the movie, that's how Sauron is defeated and dies. And like I said, Peter Jackson gets this half right and half wrong. And the reason for this will become clear in a minute. So first we're going to focus on what he gets wrong, because of course the main thing he gets wrong is Gilgalad is not involved at all. And in the original story, it's Gilgalad and Elendil who actually defeat Sauron. Where he's half right is that Isildur actually seems to be the one who kills Sauron. Now that seems contradictory, but I will explain. In Bag End, Gandalf talks to Frodo and tells him some of the history of the ring and all this, and he says, It was Gilgalad, Elven King, and Elendil of Westerness who overthrew Sauron though they themselves perished in the deed, and Isildur Elendil's son cut the ring from Sauron's hand and took it for his own. Then Sauron was vanquished, and his spirit fled and was hidden for long years until his shadow took shape again in Mirkwood. Now, this sounds like Gilgalad and Elendil pretty much did the work of killing Sauron, and then Isildur just, as Cory Olsen might put it, looted his corpse. Um... And effectively, that is basically what happened. But even here, there's a vague hint that maybe Sauron was still alive when Isildur took the ring because it's only after Isildur cut the ring from his hand that then his spirit was vanquished. And that'll become a little bit clearer later on. But we also have a second version of this story from Elrond at the Council of Elrond, where he says, I was the herald of Gilgalad and marched with his host. I was at the batter, battle of Dagorlad before the Black Gate of Mordor, where we had the mastery. For the spear of Gilgalad and the sword of Elendil, Iglos and Narsil, none could withstand. I beheld the last combat on the slopes of Orodruin, where Gilgalad fell and Elendil fell, and Narsil broke beneath him. But Sauron himself was overthrown, and Isildur cut the ring from his hand with the hilt shard of his father's sword and took it for his own. Here he doesn't really talk about the spirit of Sauron being vanquished. He just kind of gives the bare details of Gilgalad and Elendil. There's another reference where it just says basically that the only people with Elendil and Gilgalad in the final fight were Isildur for Elendil and Elrond and Círdan with um, Gilgalad. But there is one final reference that we get that really kind of clears up a lot of things and... That is actually in the Silmarillion in the chapter called Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age. First, in the, this chapter, we get a reference that sounds very much like what Gandalf tells Frodo. 
There in the valley of Gorgoroth, Anarion son of Elendil was slain, and many others. But at the last the siege was so straight that Sauron himself came forth, and he wrestled with Gilgalad and Elendil, and they both were slain, and the sword of Elendil broke under him as he fell. But Sauron also was, over, was thrown down, and with the hilt shard of Narsil, Isildur cut the ruling ring from the hand of Sauron and took it for his own. Then Sauron was for that time vanquished, and he forsook his body, and his spirit fled far away and hid in waste places, and he took no visible shape again for many long years. So there again, there's that idea of his spirit being vanquished after the cutting of the ring from his hand. But there's one more passage just after that where Isildur is speaking to Elrond about the ring, and Elrond, of course, is advising him, you need to destroy this thing, it's dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Well... But Isildur refused his, this counsel, saying, This I will have as a weregild for my father's death and my brother's. Was it not I that dealt the enemy his death blow? That is very significant. Isildur is claiming that he is the one who killed Sauron. And as we saw earlier, we get hints of that in what Gandalf says and in this earlier passage in of the Rings of Power in the Third Age. And that's really important for a few reasons. For one thing, it tells us that even though Elendil and Gilgala did the heavy lifting in terms of defeating Sauron, Sauron wasn't dead yet. It's really only like when Isildur cuts the ring that Sauron's spirit leaves its body and is, you know, really, you know, just vanquished, to use the term of the text. In other words, had he just been left there eventually Sauron probably would have recovered. It's only when the, the ring is separated from him that what you know whatever life is left in the body that he's animating is just like, okay, we're, we're done. We gotta get out of here. And of course, we have you know a little bit of precedent for this sort of thing with Sauron because he's been killed slash defeated before, right? He was defeated by who on the hound in the story of the Baron and Luthien, he wasn't really killed in that story, so that's not a really good example. But in Numenor, after he gets the last king of Numenor, Arpharazon, to very rashly attack Valinor in an attempt to gain immortality, Sauron goes down with the ship, as it were, because when Eru Iluvatar intervenes into history and opens a giant chasm and sinks the entire island of Numenor, Sauron's body is destroyed, and it's after that point that he is no longer capable of taking fair form. That body is gone forever. His spirit escapes, but his body does not. So it's, in a sense, his body is killed. As a Maya, his, his spirit never dies. It always survives in some form or another, even when the ring is destroyed. What Gandalf tells us, and I think it's Gandalf in, this, in the main story of the Lord of the Rings, is that you know, he will survive, but he'll be reduced to a point of impotence to the point that he can't ever take shape again, can't really affect the affairs of men again. You know, he'll he'll be just a spirit wandering around with no way to do anything. So what happens here seems to be kind of the same thing. Sauron is there. His body is still inhabited by his spirit, unlike in Numenor where when it sank beneath the waves, his body was destroyed and his spirit had to, you know, return to Middle-earth and take shape again, which it was able to do fairly quickly because the ring was still, you know, if not in his direct possession, at least not in the hands of anybody else. It was waiting for him to come back in Mordor. So when Isildur cuts the ring from his hand, that's kind of the final straw that reduces him to, you know, not being able to maintain that form anymore. He's that body that he had that was overthrown or thrown down or whatever you want to say by Gilgalad and Elendil, that body is now toast. It's gone. And he, he can't maintain that form anymore. But it's Isildur cutting the ring from his hand that does that. Why is this important, though? Again, this is not mere trivia. It may seem like it is, but this is really important to Isildur's characterization because Isildur here is taking a lot of the credit for something that 
his father Elindil and Gilgala the Elven King really accomplished. Isildur comes along after Sauron has already been thrown down or overthrown and takes the ring from Sauron's body. Now, this is really him reaching. He's, you know, he's basically saying, well, didn't I, you know, didn't I kill Sauron? Her, her. It's like, well, yeah, you kind of did, but I mean, you did it when he was already basically completely busted up and just lying there gasping for breath. That's not extremely impressive, Isildur. Uh, so it, it's a really important point here because this is clearly the ring already at work on Isildur's mind. Now, of course, there's a lot of different versions of what happened to Isildur with the ring and afterward, uh, and I, I don't think I've done a video on it yet, and I've been meaning to for probably a couple of years and just haven't gotten to it, but there's a really interesting retcon of Isildur's character here uh, that we get in the Unfinished Tales, but the point here is we can already see that ring psychology at work, you know, getting Isildur to claim it for himself because, well, I earned it, didn't I? I killed Sauron. I'm the man. It's like, well, nah, not really. What he did killed Sauron, but that's really kind of a lame accomplishment compared to what had just happened. As bad as the excuse, well, I'm claiming this is a were guild for, you know, my father and my brother... That's kind of a lame excuse because, as the Tolkien professor Corey Olson has explained, the Ware Guild is what you get instead of killing the person who killed your close relative. Since you just killed Sauron, yeah, that's he's already dead, so that doesn't really work. Now, this does make that argument a little bit trickier, I think, because... I think I think Corey Olson was actually under the impression that Sauron was already dead and like legit dead whenever the ring was taken, whereas I don't think he actually was. And so you could make the argument that Isildur walks up to his body, which is still kind of gasping for breath, and says, you know what, I'm taking this ring because you owe me, pal. And then when he does it, then Sauron dies, which might not have been expected. So... Maybe that argument has a little more weight than Corey Olson gave it whenever he had examined that in the Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, but that that's kind of a weird question. But the main point is the Ware Guild argument is not a very good one because by the time that he actually claims the ring, Sauron is dead. And it's no longer a matter of repaying because Sauron's death repaid the debt that was owed for the death of Elendil and Anarion. So, yeah, his arguments are kind of weak, and we can see that ring thing going on. You know, everybody who owns the ring ends up having some kind of, you know, rationale with themselves about why it's theirs, their precious, their whatever. And this is Isildur's, and he brings up this, you know, I killed Sauron, and that's easily the weakest argument that he could come up with, because it's like... Yeah, you walked up on the guy when he was already, you know, helpless and couldn't do anything and took his finger and went, and that's your claim to fame? That's how you earned the ring? That's a really bad excuse. So this is why it's not entirely trivial who actually killed Sauron. The fact that it was Isildur who technically killed Sauron but who also did virtually nothing to achieve that feat in, in the scheme of things, that, you know, tells us something about Isildur and the way the ring is working on his mind when he then later claims, wasn't it me who killed him? Yeah, yeah that, that's, um, that, that's not a rational person talking, that's the ring talking. So... That's why I think at the end of the day, this question is actually significant, but it's also just interesting in its own right, because most of the references to how this whole battle goes down are very compressed in narrative and vague in detail, and so it's not really clear who actually did it. But at the end of the day, this is why Peter Jackson got it half right, half wrong. He's half wrong because Elendil and Gilgalad are the ones who actually defeat Sauron. And in his movie, of course, Elendil 
doesn't even get a hit in. I mean, he just gets smacked, and Gilgalad is nowhere to even be seen, which is interesting because he shows us a glimpse of Gilgalad, who's an elven king, and then apparently he's never elven king again, even though there's no indication he was even killed by Sauron. Uh, but he's half right because it is actually Isildur cutting the ring off of Sauron's hand that finishes him off. And even though I don't necessarily think that it would have gone down the way that Peter Jackson shows it in the movie, you do have to wonder what exactly did happen in Tolkien's mind when Isildur cut that ring off. What happened to Sauron's body? Did it disappear? Did it do something like the Witch King in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. I mean, it's an open question, and it's an interesting one, but we really don't have any detail there. But what we do have is a bunch of fairly vague statements, but just enough information to let us think that Isildur really was the one to kill him that we can say, well, Peter Jackson actually got that part right, even though it seems like he didn't if you just read The Lord of the Rings and didn't pay careful attention. So that's my analysis of this topic let me know if you think there's any other passages that I should have mentioned that bear on this question. I think I covered really the main ones. There may be a couple stray references here or there, but these are the big ones that really give us the most information at least. Uh, but if you did enjoy the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it around. You can also find me on Odyssey and Rumble and find podcast versions of these as well. Please also subscribe and click the bell icon to make sure you get notifications for all my future content. And you can find me at Twitter at JRRT Lore for occasional Tolkien related trivia questions. And support me over at Patreon. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore channel. Namarie.